The second round of thrust to weight ratio, fuel and performance analysis travels back to the mid to early 70s, discussing the American F4 E-45 MC, the Soviet MiG-21 BIS, and the French Mirage F1 CE. This chapter of the study follows the same modus operandi as the previous one, with different sets of scenarios and tests through which each fighter has been tested multiple times. This table shows the characteristics and parameters of several aircraft. As mentioned in the previous video discussing the F-14A and the F-14B, engine thrust is only one of the many variables needed to describe an aeroplane's performance. For example, the three engines here discussed, the French Snecma, Atar 9K50, the American General Electric J79, and the Soviet Tumansky R25, all provide, more or less, the same amount of thrust. This is where aerodynamic solutions, aircraft design, construction materials, weight, and many more details come into play. For example, the Mirage F1 is more than 20% heavier than the MiG-21. The F4 is even heavier, but it is the only fighter of the three sporting two engines and two crew members. When controllable parameters are added, such as the internal fuel and various types of payload affecting the total weight and the drag index, determining the best performing aircraft is nearly impossible without circumscribing the scenario in a defined set of rules. F4E Phantom II A Navy design adopted after a long gestation, the F4 Phantom is one of the most ubiquitous fighter jets in the world and, hands down, the best module in DCS quality-wise. Currently, only the F4E-45MC is available in the game, a version that includes features introduced until 1974. This makes this version of the Phantom II a contemporary of the earliest F-14 Tomcat, which is unfortunately not present in the game. The F-4 entered USAF service long before the mentioned date. This table shows some of the differences between the F-4C up until the F-4G. Parenthesis, the Spey engines. Most British Phantom IIs mounted an alternative to the turbojet J-79, two Rolls-Royce Spey low-bypass turbofan engines. Capable of providing more thrust and reducing consumption, not to mention the smoke, the Spey provided other positive characteristics at the cost of a lower maximum speed. Unfortunately, I doubt we will ever see a proper British Phantom in DCS, and probably F4J or F4S will end up serving in the virtual British forces. Back to the numbers. I've extensively covered the F4E's features on fly and wire, so let's jump straight into numbers and charts, starting with the ground level performance. Down in the weeds, the performance of the clean F4E is excellent both in reheat and military thrust settings. The J79's afterburners pushed the Phantom through the transonic range with ease, and only the addition of a heavy external payload prevented it from doing so. Without the bags, in fact, the tested Phantom carries the normalised 10,000 pounds of fuel plus a non-indifferent set of 4AIM-9 Sidewinder and 4AIM-7 Sparrow, the latter mounted in wells capable of reducing drag. The configuration sporting fuel tanks is instead very heavy, three massive tanks capable of providing an additional 8,700 pounds of fuel. The idea was to mimic a high drag configuration, something similar to the many air-to-ground heavy loadouts this magnificent aircraft can carry while maintaining a useful air-to-air -air setup. Worst case, the bags can be jettisoned. The acceleration decreases noticeably at military thrust, especially when the fuel tanks are loaded. The 40-second detail shows how the clean and payload configurations behave somewhat closely, but the bags are really having an impact not only in terms of top speed, but also acceleration. The 30,000-foot scenario shows the stunning power of a clean F4E Phantom II. This aircraft is fast, and the envelope almost resembles a line rather than a curve. As a brief parenthesis, I wonder how the hard wing pre slats Phantom would behave in terms of raw performance, as the slats added to the F4 E traded maneuverability for speed by increasing drag. Back to the charts, the addition of payload and or fuel tanks does not impact the curves until the second half of the transonic region. In this area of the envelope, in fact, the 4x4 AIM-7 and AIM-9 configurations suffer less. Remarkably enough, this setup and payload plus fuel tanks do not seem to stop their acceleration at Mark 1.2. The military thrust tests are quite peculiar as each curve differs. 
Clean seems to increase its acceleration as the fighter enters the transonic region. Then, the trend softens close to M1, but the Phantom still accelerates and reaches Mach 1.08 at the end of the test. The Phantom can therefore supercruise, although being clean, its usefulness is dubious. In fact, moving forward, the 4x4 configuration is capable of settling at a speed very close to Mach 1. I have not checked the DI values acronym for drag index, but I guess the AIM-9s may be the greatest drag source in this setup. If there is enough interest, I can test a 4 Sparrow and full internal fuel configuration and verify whether it is capable of supercruising, perhaps at a higher altitude, or after a minor unload to ease the transonic transition. Nevertheless, it is a great indicator of the qualities of the Phantom as a fighter jet design. When three fuel tanks are added, the outcome is quite interesting. In particular, the acceleration is drastically impacted, but, contrary to other aircraft, the trend persists. In other words, the speed is increased at a very slow pace, to the extent that the cutoff of Mach 0.7 has eliminated more than half of the collected values, but the Phantom keeps accelerating. The 40-second details show three different groups of results. The clean reheat test skyrocketed away, leaving the payload and payload plus fuel tank configurations close together. At mill power instead, clean and payload behave similarly, but the payload plus bag setup lagged behind. The pair of General Electric J79 powering the F4E are turbojets, belonging to an older generation of aircraft engines. In fact, they were later superseded by the first generation of afterburning turbofans. An example is the Pratt and Whitney TF30, used by the F14A and described in the previous video of this series. Shortly after, newer designs like the F100 mounted the F15 were introduced. As mentioned, the British Phantom were usually powered by the Rolls-Royce Spee. Back to the study, the J79 are inefficient at low altitudes and with reheat. However, they perform much, much better at 30,000 feet, de facto doubling the endurance from 7 to 15 minutes if supplied only by the internal fuel, or up to 26 minutes with a heavy three bags loadout. The military thrust scenarios somewhat reflect this observation. At medium to high altitudes, in fact, the endurance is more than double compared to low altitudes. With three external tanks, the Phantom II has fuel for days. It would be interesting to calculate the best configuration, but just eyeballing the collected data, two bags plus maintaining a decent altitude, should result in a pretty good trade-off between flight time capability, drag and speed. Mikoyan Gurevich MiG-21 Biz Codenamed Fishbed by NATO, the MiG-21 is a good challenger to the Phantom II for the title of the most iconic mid-Cold War aeroplane. Both were produced in staggering numbers, almost 14,000 for the MiG, over 5,100 for the Phantom II. The Fishbed is the first single-engine fighter aeroplane analysed so far. Throughout its long history, this lightweight fighter was tasked with a plethora of roles, from point defence interceptor to air to ground and reconnaissance. DCS MiG-21 BIS has been one of the very first modules added to the original Kamov Car 50 and A10C. This version represents a 1970s evolution of the fish bed, with increased internal fuel, improved radar, power plant and engine and capabilities such as the internal gun compared to the original variants. The top-down view of the MiG-21 reveals some core features of its design. The thin body and the delta wings enabled the fish bed to reach extremely high speeds. The initial Tumansky R11 was quite underpowered, delivering 38.7 kN at military and 60.6 kN with reheat. The BIS received the upgraded Tumansky R25-300. This compact afterburning turbojet was relatively low powered and capable of generating 41 kN thrust dry and 70 kN with afterburner. For example, each single General Electric J79 generated circa 53 kN dry and 80 kN with reheat. Keep in mind the low power output of the military thrust setting because it will tell us a lot about the performance of this aircraft. Let's start the data analysis, as usual from the ground level test. As we have just discussed, the power output of the Tumansky R25-300 with reheat is 70% higher, and we can really see that. In fact, past Mach 1.1, the engine overspeeds, and a flameout occurs. 
Since there is minimal warning in the cockpit, the pilot has to monitor the airspeed indicator. Moreover, the acceleration between Mach 1 and Mach 1.1 is eye-watering, thus requiring very careful management. The external payload test is one of the most complete possible, with four R60 and a pair of R13 M1. The performance of the fish bed is impacted, but only slightly. The Tomansky R25-300 pushes the aircraft through the transonic region with ease. At the end of the test, the top speed is slightly lower than the overspeed threshold. The fuel tank test adds an 800 litre tank underneath the belly, increasing the fuel capacity by approximately 1400 pounds. The additional payload causes the fish bed to reduce its top speed tangibly, and the aircraft fails to break through the high drag transonic range. If the afterburner is not used, the output of the Tomansky R25-300 turbojet is limited, and the MiG-21 shows it. Interestingly, there is not a lot of difference between the loadout settings. Whether the fish bed is clean or with stores and bags, the acceleration is mediocre. That being said, the trend seems to continue and the curve does not flatten. Ergo, a pilot can use reheat to supplement the lackluster acceleration, then revert to military thrust to maintain the high speed so obtained. At 30,000 feet, the charts become even more interesting. The reheat curves show how fast the MiG-21 can go. It passes the transonic region with ease and aggressively accelerates towards Mark II. The presence of six air-to-air -air missiles affects the performance only marginally. The most significant impact on the fish bed's performance is the combination of missiles and the 800-litre fuel tanks. However, even in such a case, the MiG continues to accelerate homogeneously, but at a lower grade. The military thrust tests baffled me, so I gathered more runs than usual. The average is shown in the chart. As you can see, the trend is similar across the three configurations and highlighted by poor acceleration characteristics. Clean maintains a positive trend, followed by the air-to-air -air configuration. The addition of the external fuel tank flatlined the curve instead. I had to spawn the MiG-21 at Mach 0.67 rather than the usual Mach 0.6 or lower to collect enough meaningful data. Given the unexpected results, I wondered whether my modus operandi was flawed. However, the results seem consistent across multiple takes and results. Now, if you think I made a mistake, please let me know. I am more than happy to correct the problem and take a fresh batch of data. Thanks. Regarding fuel consumption and autonomy, the Tomansky R25-300's ground level flameout leaves used without one crucial parameter. If there is enough interest, I can collect more data while maintaining a speed close to Mach 1.1 and verify the fuel consumption over time. If the military thrust setting is an indicator, we may find an extremely high fuel consumption of circa 720 pounds per minute. Although the performance in military thrust setting up high was poor, the endurance benefits tangibly. Although we are far from the Phantom II's endurance with three bags, the MiG-21 can stay in the air for a decent amount of time, which can be improved even more by adjusting altitude and thrust settings. Mirage F1CE. The French aviation industry is one of the most underrepresented in video games. A fate similar to many unforgivably forgotten British products, such as the Hawker Hunter or the English Electric Canberra. With most players focused on the Cold War and the conflict between US NATO and the Soviets or modern Russia, it is easy to lose sight of the aeroplanes that literally shaped the world as we know it today. Aeroplanes from the Mirage family to the Super Etendar and the Sepakat Jaguar participated in many conflicts. The Mirages and locally built variants were staples of the IDF AF and later fought around the world from Pakistan to the Falklands Malvinas. In this theatre, the Exocet carrying Super Etendard was one of the greatest threats to the British forces. The Iraqi Air Force also fielded five Super Etendard, along with the Mirage F1. They faced Iranian F-14A Tomcats and various versions of F-4 Phantom II, F-5AB Freedom Fighter, and EF Tiger II. The Mirage F-1 also served alongside European forces such as the Ejército del Aire, the Spanish Air Force. In DCS we find multiple versions of the Mirage F-1, including a two-seater and a modernized version. This study covers the first to enter service, the Mirage F-1CE. This aircraft, originally introduced in French service in 1974, was purchased by the Spanish in the mid to late 1970s. In addition to French-built ordnance, it features familiar missiles such as the AIM-9 Sidewinder. 
The Mirage F1 CE is powered by a single turbojet Snecma Atar 9K-50. The roots of this family of engines date back to the Second World War. Similarly to other allies countries, such as the USA or the Soviets, the French learnt a lot from the technological innovations developed by Nazi Germany, or directly employed German engineers. In particular, the Snecma Atar engines are derived from the BMW 018 project. The Atar 9 is a late 50s design, the result of a decade of improvements. It went on to power aircraft such as the Mirage 3 and 5 and the Super Etendard. The 9K50 is a further improvement with better fuel consumption and powers the Mirage F1. The payload carried by the Mirage F1 in these tests filled every available station. The air-to-air -air setup features two AIM-9 Sidewinders and two Super 530EM. The fuel tank loadout includes one underbelly 1,137-litre bag. At ground level altitude, the Mirage F1 shows two faces depending on whether the reheat is used. The afterburner provides the F1 with a considerable acceleration, almost non affected by the additional external loadout. However, the French fighter seems to be hitting a wall as it enters the transonic range. As more payload is added, the more the F1 struggles to reach supersonic speed. The speed settles at circa M.95 when the fuel tank is added. The Atar 9K produces circa 45% more thrust with reheat. The effect of not using the afterburner is dramatic and the acceleration is sluggish. Interestingly, the trend is somewhat similar throughout the three configurations. The additional external load simply decreases the pitch of the curve and the speed at which the Mirage settles. This appears to be another case where the acceleration provided by the afterburner is a solid means of pushing the aircraft to a speed then maintained by the military thrust setting. The curves at 30,000 feet are some of the most peculiar discussed so far. When reheat is used, the three configurations almost mirror each other, the payload set up as a sort of bisector. The clean Mirage F1 is extremely fast, de facto unaffected by the transonic region. At the end of the data collection period, it shows no signs of slowing down at all. The heaviest loadout tested, comprising air-to-air -air missiles and a fuel tank, really struggles. The acceleration is not bad per se, but the transonic region is a wall too tough to crack. Although beyond the purpose of this study, a pilot may still be able to unload, accelerate, and maintain supersonic speed even with such a loadout. If the fuel tank is not carried instead, the Mirage F1 is fully armed and extremely fast, and the transonic region only partially affects its performance. Without reheat, the Mirage F1 shows a behaviour almost identical to the one observed down in the weeds. The clean configuration is extremely fast, and the aircraft appears to be barely able to supercruise. Although this is quite an arguable achievement since the F1 seems to settle at circa Mark 1.02. Still, at Mach 1, the peak of the transonic drag is almost past, and unloading may help the aircraft to achieve and maintain higher speeds. Interestingly, Adding air-to-air -air weapons only marginally affects the overall performance, as the Mirage settles close to Mach 1, but the acceleration seems to be the most affected. The quite-sized 1,137-litre fuel tank instead provides too much drag, and the ATAR 9K50 struggles at military thrust configuration. This chart shows how a pilot can save fuel by maintaining a conservative thrust setting, then jettisoning the fuel tank and sprinting through the transonic region with ease, even with a full air-to-air -air loadout. Fuel-wise, the Atar 9K-50 shows the most unusual results. This engine seems efficient at high altitudes, whereas it is poor at best down low when reheat is used. The fuel consumption at low altitudes is in fact 360% compared to 30,000 feet. In the military thrust setting, the endurance increases considerably. Nevertheless, the Atar still uses more than twice the quantity of fuel at low altitudes compared to up high.